morning, everyone. Well, it's a real delight for me to be able to uh, moderate a discussion with Ann Applebaum and Gary Kasparov. What a, what a pleasure. Um, we've all known each other for some time. I've known Gary for what, 30, well, yeah. almost okay. 30 Don't years. Don't mention 30 years, okay, yes. No. <laughs> You're not that old, surely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, uh, there was time when my hair was strong. <laughs> Well, it's a real pleasure because, I, uh, first of all, um, both um, uh, Gary and Ann have books out on the subject that we're going to discuss today, and uh, please go to the bookstore and look for them because they both offer a terrific uh, perspective on things that are underway between uh, the United States and, and Russia, but a lot of the backstory uh, too, which would be uh, extremely important to understand how we got where we are. Um, and uh, we have a great opportunity to engage them in conversation today. So, Anne, let me start with you. Uh, you've just written a terrific book um, on uh, the U uh, Ukraine famine called Red Famine. Um, and maybe you could um, put into perspective for us, because I, I'd like to bring Gary in um, on this too, about how the history um, of the, uh, what is today the former Soviet Union uh, really informs where we are today. So maybe you could, w let's start at 30,000 feet and uh, work our way down to some of the specific issues. Well, I mean, the history of the Soviet Union informs where we are today in the sense that, you know, the, what is, who is it, Faulkner, who says that the past isn't even over, it's not even past. And people continue to, to, to uh, you know, they've inherited a set of ideas, they continue to live with them. Um, you know, my, my book is about something, a, a more specific piece of that, which is um, the, the tension between the Soviet Union, it was really between Stalin and Ukraine, starting, the book actually starts at the beginning from the moment of the Russian Revolution, the tension between Bolshevism and the Ukrainian national movement. And the Ukrainian national movement was like, the Na Polish national movement at that time, or the Estonian national movement, was, in a, was a, a, a movement that desired to set up an independent Ukraine as an independent state. And the trouble was is that any definition of independent Ukraine in a, in a context in which Ukraine had always been a colony of, of Russia, or had at least, or in previous, previous a colony of Poland, um, necessarily meant Ukraine turning west and becoming more pro-Western. Um, and this was something that Stalin couldn't accept, the idea that Ukraine would leave, that it would, but also not, not just because he would lose the grain and so on, but also because it meant that it was a, it could possibly undermine the Bolshevik project. You know, if the Ukrainians were pro-Western, then, then how, then, then Bolshevism itself would lose legitimacy. This is a little bit similar to the phenomenon that we have today. Um, so why was Putin in 2014 so upset about Ukraine? It was because what did he see, what happened in Kiev? He saw lots of young people, they went down to the Maidan, their main square, they waved European flags, and they chanted slogans about ending corruption. Um, and what happened after that? The president fled the country, people went into, took over his, his house, his vulgar mansion, there were photographs of the gold taps or the, you know, and the, the revolting art collections. This is exactly what Putin is afraid of. He is afraid of a pro-Western movement in his own country. He saw it happening in Ukraine. Um, he wanted to stop it, um, and he's afraid of it happening um, in Russia. Um, the, the fear that Western ideas, that ideas about democracy, ideas about Europe, what most Russians feel European, um, and they, they find the idea of the European Union attractive, um, uh, fundamentally, the, that ideas from the West will undermine the system. In the past, it was the Soviet system. Now it's an autocratic and, and kleptocratic um, corrupt system um, is what is driving foreign policy, or sort of Russian policy towards Ukraine and also really towards the outside world. This kind of um, KGB mentality, it's us against them. Um, their ideas can, will poison our people. Um, and they, and, 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 and this, um, this syndrome is something that we, you know, I don't want to say that we are living in an era that is the same as the past. The modern Russia is not the Soviet Union. It's not a full-on totalitarian state. But this paranoia about the West and Western democracy um, is something that remains in Russia. And it's, a, it's pretty fundamental, I think, to explaining why things are the way they are right now. 
Well, thank you for that um, great overview, and this is a wonderful segue to you, Gary, because <clears throat> I think we met um, certainly right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I was a regular traveler to that part of the world. Maybe even before. It, maybe even I before. before. But it, yeah, it's, it's at a time where I think it was already writing on the wall. That yeah, exactly, and, and the writing was on the wall, and, and we could see um, so many doors opening. Uh, it was extraordinary. As a matter of fact, I think I told you this morning that for the Department of Energy, I was sent to Snezhensk, which is uh, Russia's number one top secret nuclear weapons facility to help evaluate uh, non-proliferation programs there. I mean, nobody could even imagine having that opportunity today. So Gary, let me ask you, in the, in the great arc of, uh, of history, and history in this case, we're going to call it 25 or 30 year history. How do you think we got to this, to the point where we have flashpoints in Ukraine and, uh, and elsewhere? Oh, yeah, but, I think but concentrating mostly, I think, on the, the, the general, how, how do we go from um, open doors to doors that have been resolutely shut? Yeah, just a quick comment about Anne's introduction is that first, you know, I think it's semantic, but it's important, Russia's country of symbols. I always refer to 1917 shift in Russia, not at the Bolsheviks revolution, but Bolsheviks takeover. It's, it's, it should give you a better perspective right. that Bolshevism became a new form of Russian imperialism, restoring the empire. And as Bigny Brzezinski pointed out, there would be no Russian empire without Ukraine. Right. So that's, that explains everything in, of, from Stalin to Putin. Mm -hmm. Now, just, uh, and the Putin's action in Ukraine, it's, you may say it's, uh, it was a desperation, because it's not just Ukrainian nationalism. <laughs> Half of Ukraine is Russian-speaking territory. Right. And what's happening, what, what happened in Ukraine in 2014, what is happening now, it's actually not a war between Ukrainian nationalists and Russian imperialists. Most of people who are fighting the so-called Ukrainian Eastern Front against Putin's uh, invasion, they are ethnic Russians. You may call Russian it- speakers. You, you, ethnic Russians, you know, or Russian, spe Russian speaking. Yeah. And, and these people were born in the same country, Soviet Union. Most of them were born, or just they were these kids. They read the same newspapers. They spoke the same language. But somehow, you know, they just, they, they, they had a very different attitude. And one of the very important things that separates Ukraine from Russia, if you look, go back to 1991, in Russia, the power change was always decided by a few people, after, just after first Yeltsin's election. It was all about uh, the machinations uh, uh, behind uh, Kremlin walls. In Ukraine since 1994, presidents lost elections. Kravchuk lost elections, so the, the, and then uh, Kuchma has lost elections, but his man Yanukovych lost elections. Psychologically, Ukrainians, they, they realize that the power could change peacefully, not by bullets, but by ballots. And uh, they didn't want to go back to Putin's Russia. So it's, they, when they, when Putin, while Putin thought that Russian tanks and, and uh, uh, his supported guerrilla, which is almost infiltrated by Russian security forces, would be met by flowers, no. Ukrainians decided, actually Russians, or Russian-speaking Ukrainians, they decided that they had to fight back. And that's, you know, that's probably, it's, 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 um, if it's not uh, uh, the end, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the beginning of the end. You know, paraphrasing mm -hmm. Churchill. And, um, and going back to 1991, it's, 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 I think that's one of the problems, and probably we should concentrate on that, is it's not, uh, it's not what's happening in Russia, but also the fact is that America, that was the leader of the free world, failed, unlike in 1946, right. failed to come up with a vision of the future. So the Cold War has ended. No more Soviet Union. Berlin Wall collapsed. But it, it, it was an Americans, you know, Americans' responsibility to offer the vision for the future. Go, who knows? Maybe if the election 1992 would go the other way and Bush 41 could stay in the office, America would be more engaged. But the American choice was, let's move with someone who talked about economy, about prosperity. Let's celebrate. And what's happened, it's not just, you know, a Russian problem. In 1992, America could call the shots in any parts of the globe. It's, nobody could even dare thinking of hurting America. At the moment where Bill Clinton led his office in, year, in, in early 2001, Al-Qaeda was ready to strike. So it tells us that it was, again, unlike in 1946, America failed to come up with a vision that could unite the free world and also to offer perspectives for countries like Russia and how to integrate Russia in, the, in this new uh, uh, sort of global, uh, global uh, 
uh, civil civilization framework? Well, uh, you raise a number of interesting questions about uh, how the United States looks at that part of the world, whether we have a long-term strategy for it. And uh, so let me ask you, and do you think there's any um, thing that the United States could have done differently about the uh, crisis in Ukraine in 2014? You know, there's, a, there's that famous Irish saying, you know, the man is somewhere in Donegal and, you know, gets lost and turns to a local guy and says, how do I get to Dublin? And he looks at him, he said, ooh, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I feel, I always feel a little bit, you know, by the time we got to the Ukraine crisis in 2014, quite a lot of other, other things that other happened. Things that happened. Um, you know, look, it's important to remember what the, what the policy towards Russia was in the 1990s. Um, our policy towards Russia was to encourage Russia to become part of the West. Um, we invited Russia into the G7, which became for a while the G8. Um, we invited Russia into trade organizations. The Europeans invited Russia into the Council, uh, Council in Europe. And the idea was that somehow, almost by osmosis, the Russians would somehow you know, like us and learn our institution. There was actually, there was quite a lot of work done. There was, a, there, you know, I was aware of, I was actually part of some democracy promotion programs. People, um, people went and tried to discuss judicial reform and there were some efforts made, but the idea was that somehow by osmosis, Russians would become like us and that therefore, and that that was gonna happen as a matter of inevitability. They just, because our system is so obviously much better, they would just adopt it. Um, and that didn't happen. I mean, it didn't happen for a lot of reasons. Um, one, because one of the first things that really happened in Russia in the 1990s while we were inviting them institutions was that um, the old Russian elite, or part of it rather, and in particularly the part um, connected to the KGB, began stealing state property and then converting that property into power. So while we were talking about democracy and in, you know, I don't know, judicial reform, actually what was happening was the creation of a new form of autocracy based on a very small oligarchic elite. Um, and it took us a really long time to notice this. I mean, yeah. a really, really long time. So you could see it beginning in the 1990s. Um, when Putin came to power, um, you know, it, it took a slightly different direction, but it became um, even more intense. Um, you know, I gave a lecture, and I remember this because it was, in, I think it was in 2005 or 6 in Germany, and the topic at that time was Putinism. I mean, it was my title of the, of the lecture. And I described, here's what's happening, here's how Putin is taking over the state, here's how he's creating a small group of people who own most of the economy. They don't just run it, they also own it. Um, here's how they're taking over the media and parceling it out between the big, you know, big economic groups. Um, here's how they're taking over all, over all the, you know, the checks and balances inside the economy, you know, not just the, you know, the media, the industry, the, the, the secret services, and so on. Um, and I described this phenomenon, which we would now call, I don't know, a f illiberal democracy or one-party statism, or I called it Putinism. And I had this huge pushback from a German audience in Berlin who said, how can you say this? Russia is a great trading partner. There are lots of liberals in Russia. We're, you know, my bank trades with their banks and it's all going really well. And people just did not want to hear this. And they did not want to hear that that kind of a state was developing and they didn't want to hear that it could ever be potentially anti-Western. I mean, it was almost as if, you know, we'd solved the problem of the Cold War. You know, it was over, you're right. We, we threw George Bush out of office. We, um, we decided that what we want instead is to move on to other problems. There are other things we'd rather be talking about. I don't know, we want to talk about Africa or we want to talk about, um, you know, we wanted to start focusing on the Middle East. And we had, there was this idea that Russia doesn't matter anymore. We can just, you know, it's its own, it lives off in its own space somewhere in the north and it will deal with itself and eventually it will just, you know, somehow become like us. And we missed this moment when right. authoritarianism was beginning. I mean, you, you know exactly right. what I'm talking about, Susan. Um, and we failed to speak up about it. We failed to stop it. We kept treating Russia as if it were a democracy, um, as if it were just like us. Um, uh, above all, we failed to um, examine our own role in, the, in Russian money laundering and in Russian 
um, in this, you know, the, 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 the stealing of money from the country, the laundering of the West that went back. I mean, our banks and our financial institutions played a huge role in that yeah. and essentially facilitated it. So this was the moment, I think, that we missed. Um, uh, in, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, why didn't we say, you know, this system, you know, is not compatible with ours. This, you know, this, you know, we, we can't accept this kind of money laundering and theft. Uh, well, that uh, yeah. Gary, I know you're going to want to respond to that, but I would invite so you. Is no, 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 no. I would invite you. Up. Okay, respond to me then. I would like to invite you to um, comment on what happens even a little bit earlier than uh, Anne's very comprehensive uh, evaluation of what came after that. How much do you think the economic, the radical economic reform program? that was introduced, the so-called 500 Days Program, which they were planning to turn a uh, command uh, economy into a capitalist society in fi uh, 500 days. That was the plan. It was a ra radical exactly. economic program uh, that then uh, brought about um, a lot of dislocation. Uh, and I just was wondering if you could see, tie together what I just proposed and uh, Anne's uh, very useful comments. Um, yeah. Anne is right, so this, the moment of this transformation has been missed. But there's so many concessions have been offered to Russian elite mm -hmm. without you know, any reciprocity. So this is America and the free world, they, they, they were in a position to actually demand uh, domestic concessions that to move uh, Russia from uh, this centralized state to, to an open market economy. Actually, it was never free market economy. So yeah, it's an illusion. Right? Yeah. And by yeah, the way, you know, happened. now we look at some documents <laughs> being released. Yeltsin made his peace with KGB in, all the way back in 1992. Already, in, you know, not allowing, but basically recommending KGB officers to be assigned to sort of the top government officials. It's not by accident you had Putin next to Sobchak, mayor of St. Petersburg, yeah. and every key position already had some sort of a KGB connection. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the guy there is a big reformer. One of the one of these uh, uh, so, uh, first actions of this government was to save a KGB-controlled bank by assigning one billion euro dollars. So to save this bank from, 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 from bankruptcy, the bank that has been, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a cover, uh, has been financing cover-up KGB operations. So this, and it's, it's a long story just to show that in, in 92, 93, 94, the free world, you know, turned this blind eye to what was happening in Russia, basically saying, okay, it's now no longer an existential threat. And the fact is that the power has been accumulating in Yeltsin's hands. Right. And since 1993, where Yeltsin basically destroyed any opposition in the parliament by using tanks on the streets. So it's, Russia was already not, a, it's just a democratic state by any standard. It, Yeltsin probably was, yeah, Yeltsin was reserved in using these powers, but they, they, he kept accumulating them, right, basically yeah. paving road for, for KGB officers to take over. It was not an accident for Putin to take over in 99-2000. Yeah. Yeah. It was, when you went at, now analyze the history of Russia, it was very natural because from the perspectives of those Russians who were in charge at that time, A, they could get tons of money. B, nobody asked anything. They, they, should, they, should, they had to pay lip service. So just to show that they're fine, we'll be, we'll be with you. So we can just you know, throw a few votes here and there. But at the same time, West you know, kept you know, helping Yeltsin to get all the power. For instance, 1994, under heavy pressure from the United States and the United Kingdom, Ukraine had to give up its nuclear arsenal. Anybody can imagine the size of Ukrainian nuclear arsenal in year 2000, uh, in year uh, 1994, because the, in the Soviet Union, the nuclear warheads have been spread between four Soviet republics, Russia proper, Ukraine, and a little bit in Belarus and Kazakhstan. Ukraine at that time had an, a nuclear arsenal bigger than UK, France, and China combined. 2,000 nuclear warheads. Obviously, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, that would prevent, prevent any aggression. And Bill Clinton and John Major forced Ukraine to give it back to Russia, and there was a so-called Budapest Memorandum signed with Boris Yeltsin's signature on it, guaranteeing Ukrainian territorial integrity. Of course, in 2014, we heard from American administration of Brits that it was not binding. It was not binding, yes, okay, but it's, there were signatures. So it's, and there are many cases where the West could actually demand Russia to go through this, to, uh, to, to undergo these reforms. Instead, you know, it, it was all, you know, um, it's a goodwill. Like 1990, 1995, uh, Bill Clinton had quite a, just quite a unique document, bipartisan support uh, 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 to uh, 
uh, to stop any financial assistance to Russia, some form of sanctions, if Russia does not stop supporting Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian, um, Iranian nuclear program. 1995. So he could actually stop it. You know, we would not even worry about Iran anymore because it was about Russian uh, uh, um, um, transfer of nuclear technology to Iran that started it. And uh, Yeltsin said, oh, big deal, hack. Uh, nothing happened. In 1995, Bill Clinton could have killed uh, this, 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 this issue that, we, that is such, such a big problem today. And, uh, and I think it, it, it encouraged uh, so Russian elite, especially looking at what Anne said, as, as they had the free hand to p place money anywhere in the world. So we're still f finding out so, uh, how the, the Western banks and Western governments and Western politicians encouraged the, the influx of Russian money uh, to be placed everywhere and for Russians to buy property all the way from uh, uh, Riga to Miami. Well, you raised so many interesting points. I do need to uh, insert a question here, though. Uh, I was working on those issues back in 1993-94 um, when the agreement was signed on uh, moving um, the uh, Ukrainian and Kazakh and Belarusian uh, nuclear um, capability back into Russia. But uh, command and control went through Moscow. It didn't go through Kiev. It's not like the Ukrainians could have used those weapons. And uh, no, I just say that as a perspective building device. I mean, uh, but it was a bargaining chip uh, for sure. One other thing I'd like to uh, just insert here for the audience is if you're wondering why America really wasn't paying attention to Russia, right as the Soviet Union is collapsing, we already start the first Gulf War. And, and we have been really mm -hmm. focused on that. So Anne, to what degree do you find that the other engagements we've been involved in um, around the world have affected our um, capacity to look at these events clearly and uh, to form a kind of durable, sustainable set of relationships with that part of the world? Well, I mean, we've been distracted by many things. I mean, you're right, the, 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 the Gulf War, I mean, some distractions were forced upon us, like right. the war in Bosnia, for example, which right. was also... Um, uh, you know, which also required a lot of time. I mean, it, it's important to remember that the, you know, even the President of the United States has, there's sort of so much time and energy that can be spent on, right. on any one problem at the time. But I think the, what's underlying your question is this, this question of why we haven't had a strategy towards Russia. Exactly. You know, we didn't have, a, you know, nobody, there were, there were very few moments where people sat down and said, okay, what, what do we want this relationship to look like? What, le as, you, as Gary says, what levers of pressure do we have? Yeah. What's going badly and how should we fix it? Um, what, you know, what, what direction should it go in? Um, how, how, you know, how much do we care about the fact, and for example, this goes back several years now, how much do we care about Russia's ever deepening involvement in European politics, Russian support for the far right in, in Europe, in, in, you know, which is now mm -hmm. happens online. It also happens in, you know, in terms of money and assistance. Um, how much do we care about that? And there wasn't a moment where people took it seriously as a threat. Um, and it is, I admit that it's a complicated threat. You know, if you look around the world, what are the big powerful countries which might be a problem for us? Well, obviously the main one is China. China is, a, is clearly a real rival. Um, China is a country with real ambitions. Um, its economy is many times larger than the Russian economy, which is relatively very small. Um, but in the near term, Russia is the one country that, um, that genuinely seeks to, 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 to block us, to harm us, and which is seeking to undermine our own political system and the political systems of our allies. Um, again, through, and I'm not sure it can succeed. I mean, maybe it's it exaggerated its ability, but the the funding of of extremist groups, the use of corruption, um, you know, all these things have been focused on us and at us for a very long time, and it, it has never been taken seriously by any recent president. Actually, I mean, it wasn't taken seriously by um, by Obama. Um, it wasn't taken seriously by uh, George W. Bush, who was focused on, of course, the war on terrorism. Um, so, you know, you know we, we've had this cumulative effect over many years of one country, which is a revanchist, revisionist power, which sees itself as having fallen from its previous global role, which wants that role back, and which sees us, I mean, really genuinely us, we are, we are the main feature on Russian television every night, even though I think most Americans don't know that, and, and you know, arguments about us and, and attacks on us, which sees us as somehow 
um, disrupting, you know, having uh, usurped Russia's, you know, rightful place in the world. Um, and we haven't had a strategy towards Russia to, to, um, to balance that. Uh, please. Yes, it's uh, Russian television is state-controlled television is filled with 24/7 anti-American propaganda, and uh, it's w worse than the 1980s. I mean, it's oh, I no, 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 M yeah. much worse. Much worse. No, much yeah. worse. Yeah, much worse. My mother, she's turning 82 in in a couple of months, so she born in 1937. She heard it all, you know, from Stalin to Khrushchev to Brezhnev. She still lives in Moscow, and, and she says it's the worst. Because at least in the Soviet Union, they tried to sell some sort of this you know, fake vision of the future, bright future, communist, <laughs> brotherhood. Now it's more like cult of death. It's, it's, there's, there's no bright future. It's our country, our beloved Russia is surrounded by enemies. It's a besieged fortress. And our Vladimir Putin is the only white knight that can defend Mother Russia. So, and of course, anything that happens in the world is connected to America. It's not about Ukrainian fascists. It's about Ukrainian fascists instigated by CIA. It's not about Baltics. It's not about Syria. America is, is a devil that is everywhere. And by the way, it hasn't, ha it, it, it hasn't started uh, recently. Even during the years of so-called reset policy with Obama, it was there. Because Vladimir Putin, he knew that at a certain point, every dictator had to face this tough choice. Economy is no longer serving you. It's no longer your ally. It's falling apart. So you have to replace it with, with enemies. You run out of enemies inside the country, you go out of the country. And for Vladimir Putin to keep his image of an invincible leader, dictator, he needed to defy the strongest country in the world. So that's why America is the target number one. And it's not going to change. And, uh, and he believes that you know, he can go anywhere because so far retaliation against his involvement in European politics and American politics was, was minimal. It's Anne mentioned uh, pushback in Germany in 2005, tried 2019. When just, you know, thanks to Vladimir Putin, you have 94 neo-Nazis in German Bundestag. Third largest party in Germany is neo-Nazi. And by the way, after a few elections in East Germany, that could be probably the second party in Germany now. So, no. and it's purely a result of this, you know, unbashing it's, uh, actions of Vladimir Putin. So he just, he said, been throwing money, supporting them through Russian community there. It's, it's a, like a longer story, but it's, at the same time, Germany, after Crimean invasion, doubled the amount of Russian gas it's buying, doubled. So it's, it's, all about, it's all about business as usual. And from Vladimir Putin's perspective, so it's even with the sanctions, nobody wants to recognize, most of the politicians in Europe don't want to recognize that Putin is at war with them. And even if you are much stronger economically, politically, militarily, you have to recognize you are at war. Otherwise, you'll be losing as we have been losing for quite a while. I'd, I'd like to, th this has been uh, extremely interesting. I'd like to add one uh, perspective building device from my uh, point of view, and then I'd like to ask what we can do about this and what our policy should be going forward, uh, just in the interest of time. The, the only um, perspective building device I'd like to, um, to offer is yes, we are under attack all the time, not only by Russia, uh, but by uh, China and any of our other rivals. So this is why our domestic Unity is so important. We are a fertile ground, and we are responsible for that, not the other great powers. Uh, and we have to understand that, because they've been doing versions of this um, since time immemorial. It's, yes, it's probably a lot worse now, but it's up to us to create a society where we are not so vulnerable to their propaganda. Having said that, there are two schools, at least two schools of thought, maybe three or four, in a place like Washington about how we ought to proceed, what the, whether engagement is a good idea, whether total isolation is the way to handle this problem, and what would you say? So I would, I would follow the money, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I would focus on, uh, I would focus on, I mean, I think, that, I mean, contrary to what some say, the, the sanctions that we've put on Russia have actually been quite successful. Mm -hmm in that they have, they've curtailed some of, um, some of the oligarchs' business uh, ability to do business. Um, it, they have annoyed the Russian leadership a great deal. That's one of the reasons why they've put so much effort in trying to un undo them. Every time Putin meets Trump, that's apparently one of the things that he talks about. What else they talk about, we, of course, don't know. <laughs> but, <okay. laughs> um, you know also remember what the sanctions were. Uh, the sanctions weren't aimed not at the Russian people. They, we weren't, you know, preventing medicine from being sold in Russia. 
um, they were aimed at particular people mm -hmm. and particular companies that were known to be very tightly connected to the president and so on. So I think that it's been, a, it's been very useful. Um, Bill Browder's model, which is um, this famous Magnitsky Act, this was a, um, an idea of sanctioning Russian um, business, Russian, Russian uh, officials lower down the totem pole as well, whom we know to have been involved in human rights abuses. That, that's all. That's all very useful. But I would go a lot farther. I would. I mean, why can't we end money laundering? I mean, first of all, we should end it because it's bad for us. Mm -hmm. um, but let's end. It, let's you know. Let's shut down um, the, the Cayman Islands. You know. Let's shut down. Um, you know the, the 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 sources of illegal money. There enormous amount of illegal money now flows through our system. It flows through Europe, yeah. um, and it's profoundly corrupting. I mean, I know that some you know there's some use for offshore funds in certain places, and there's some justification, but the 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 level of it. Um, I I recently read some statistics. Something like 10% of the world's wealth is held offshore. Mm. Um, uh, you know, the use of, you know, and the use of shell companies and fake companies that are now used to invest and, and to buy houses and, and buy property in this country. Um, this is one of the primary sources of corruption. It affects us. And this is, these are the things that the Russians have used both to, both to enrich themselves, to steal money from, from their countrymen, um, but it's also affected us. It's undermined our political system um, and it's made our political system weaker. Um, and so, you know, I would I would begin there. I would start with money, and I would um, and I would um, uh, you know prevent that and end the way that system works. And the second thing I would do, and I, I think you know Gary will want to talk about this as well, is I would take much more seriously. Mind, we've begun some of this, but take much more seriously the defense of NATO. Um, you know, let's have you know let's have NATO bases in the places where they should be. Let's put them you know on the eastern border. Um, let's pay more, more far more to, you know, what is NATO after all? NATO is a defensive organization. It's not a, it's not, we're not going to attack anybody. Um, the, the facilities that we build are defensive. Um, and, you know, Europe is kind of our tripwire. Um, it, you know, it's a, you know, defending Europe is a way of defending our trading relationships, it's a way of defending our economy, um, and thinking about um, how to reshape the way it works and the way it functions for the 21st century, I think is really important. Great, thank you. Um, Gary? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's time to actually identify priorities. And as you, you mentioned China and Russia. Yes, they both are enemies of the United States and the free world, but China is a long-term threat. Russia is an immediate threat, chess players speaking. They have tactical threats and strategic threats. Russia is an immediate threat, and by the way, China is quite happy to see Putin just uh, playing dirty for them because it helps them to build their muscles and America had to concentrate on immediate threats. But again, we just, you know, we cannot do everything at the same time. But it's very important for us to, you know, to play the strategic game because strategy is always an advantage of, of the free world because you can have uh, programs installed by one president and it could be continued by his successors. Like, you know, you have Truman, Eisenhower, and all, you know, uh, uh, way, back, way up to Reagan who actually finished the job started in, 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 late, in late 40s of opposing and diminishing uh, and, and destroying communism. Uh, so, um, uh, and um, also, I think it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also important for us to recognize the, uh, uh, the subtlety of semantics. Engagement sounds great. In practice, it's appeasement. It's not engagement. It's, uh, it's uh, reading uh, one of the Churchill's great book, The Gathering Storm. Just read what, what he's telling us about the debates in the British Parliament in 1933. I'm not talking about 1938. 34, 35, just replace the names and you have debates that we have today. One of the you know, greatest ideas of British government in 34, 35 was if we disarm, it will encourage Hitler not to go forward with his uh, armament program. <laughs> Fantastic. That's a serious debate. That was a policy of the government. So it's, and also, I mean, let's, let's name people who, who they are. Vladimir Putin is not president, he's a dictator. It's tiny semantic difference, it's important. Call dictator, dictator. As now, for instance, you know, don't call Maduro incumbent and Guaido uh, its opposition leader. I mean, start calling, you know, calling them real names. It's, it, shows, it shows our engagement, our engagement with those who are fighting for freedom. And uh, Putin's threat is, is serious because, you know, he has enough cash supplied from oil and gas 
And, and his cash is being used quite effectively to bribe politicians, to buy favors, to create a, probably the largest network of agents and lobbyists that was never you know, as, as big and effective even at the time of, the, of, of coming turn. Uh, and also, he now realized that technology invented in the free world can be effectively used to undermine the very foundation of the free world. So it's, we are at war. It's a hybrid war, it's a, you name it. But it's, it's, a, it's an open challenge. And uh, fighting, we can. I mean, it's, again, but we should use very rough word of deterrence. And in, in a Cold War, we faced much bigger threats. And the uh, Soviet Union under Stalin or Khrushchev or Brezhnev was much more powerful economically and militarily than Putin's Russia. One of the reasons Putin is so successful, because he operates with us, uh, with us not willing to recognize that he is an existential threat. It's a different threat. We used to have, oh, it's communist ideology versus free market. It's a free world. No, Putin, is, Putin doesn't care about ideology. I always call him merchant of doubt. And he's very good. It's just, you know, it's not selling you an ideology. It's about exhausting your critical thinking. It's basically telling you there's no truth. This is bad, uh, this is good, it's, who cares? And, and he's very good in dividing free society from within. He can go with far, far right, Marie Le Pen, in France, for instance, or he can go with far left, Mélenchon. He's happy to support Brexit or Corbyn. He's happy to support AFD, far right, or Delinkin. He's happy to go with anything that destroys, uh, destroys the political, political balance. And, uh, and it's a real threat. And by the way, he's quite effective. Just look at number of free and fair elections Vladimir Putin won outside of Russia. Because we never had anyone in Russia. So you look at Italy, that's run by two parties that that said you know, uh, yeah. uh, um, almost you know, sworn in, in, his, in loyalty to Putin. So uh, look, at, look at, it, at the UK now, and you can talk more about it, but it's, it, it, there's definitely Russian influence there. So, and and um, I believe that it's just, you know, it's, it's whatever happens in Europe, it's still the America's role to recover its, lead, uh, its leading position. Uh, with all due respect to Europeans and other free countries, you know, if you, ca if you count Japan, Australia, uh, and, and few, few, few more, it's America's role to actually to offer this global vision. And unless it's being done here, unless America gets its act together, uh, it, 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 could, it could close its, its, its inner divisions and to come up with one strong vision as it had in the, during the Cold War. So I think we, we will be, we, we, we get to hit the bottom. Well, um, that was very stirring, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> Um, I would just, again, offer a couple of perspectives here. What, the, the one objective we had during the Cold War was to make sure that the Soviet Union and China never got it together, that they never started co cooperating in a uh, fundamental and real way. And I will just add this. I'm sorry for inserting my voice here, but I'm personally concerned that without a longer-term strategy, even though Russia doesn't want to be you know, pushed towards China, uh, that this might happen. Actually, this came out of the, uh, <clears throat> the intelligence briefing the other day up on Capitol Hill, a warning about this. The other thing I would say, um, and then I'll ask you both to wrap it up quickly because we've, told, we've been told we have a hard stop um, in, let's see, um, seven minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we are still both the world's um, uh, largest arsenals. We are on high alert with the Russian Federation, and we have virtually no contact with them. This is irresponsible for our own national security. So I would just add here that maybe we don't want to have a whole series of engagements in certain areas. We need to discuss that, but we certainly need it in the nuclear area. Uh, just go read yeah, Bill Perry's that. book about uh, living through the Cuban Missile Crisis and other um, really frightening moments where uh, our national security was absolutely on the line and it would convince you that we need to have military to military exchanges again. Anne, um, you've got three minutes here. Would you like to wrap it up from your perspective? So I would say I agree with everything that Gary said. I would, I would add one kind of nuance, which is that what the Russians have turned out to be good at, and they, they did practice it and think about it and so on, is not so much creating anxiety about democracy or creating extremism, because we all have that anyway. I mean, it's, uh, it was part of the system. It's more funding it, accelerating it, um, uh, you know, making it, somehow making it worse. Um, funding, as you said, the AFD, um, funding the far left in other places. 
Um, and also funding, you know, and also um, using the the uh, using the you know the, the 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 problem with truth that we have on the internet anyway. In other words, um, you know, we all are beginning to have increasing difficulties telling what's true and what's not online. And, and the Russians understood very early how to use this um, politically. Um, so the one of the other you were asking about solutions. I mean, I talked about money laundering and I talked about um, deterrence. Um, but another one also should be looking at uh, the nature of our own politics. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that happened in the past was that in the in the Soviet era, it it did sometimes happen that Soviet accusations against the U.S. would encourage the U.S. to kind of fill holes and you know even inside our own political system. So it's almost as if we've now been given a warning. You know, our news information system is broken. Right. Um, you know, the internet is very easily manipulated. Okay, the Russians did it yesterday, but somebody else could do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, we need to think a lot harder about how we're gonna regulate our new information system. How are we gonna prevent this from happening? How we're gonna cur curtail anonymity? How we're gonna make it harder for people to use millions of fake accounts to create false stories? Mm -hmm. um, and we need to think also about how our own corrupt political system can be made less corrupt. Um, and if we can do those things, then it will be much harder for us to, to be manipulated. So some right. of this, some of what's happened in practice over the last couple of years should cause us to look um, at ourselves, um, you know, if we're going to become the country that can, that can lead and can, can have a strategy um, once again, then we, we need to also look at our own political system. Thanks, that's great. Yeah, very. Um, <coughs> Gary, you've got the last word okay, here. Um, uh, as long as Vladimir Putin stays in Kremlin, America and the rest of the free world are not safe. Because Vladimir Putin made um, uh, uh, his campaign to defy America, to fight American interests globally, the core of his domestic propaganda. It's, it's, it's a policy of his survival. He has nothing else to offer. There's no other explanation to Russian public why it, at the time of this economic turmoil and disaster for millions of Russians, he's still there. So it's like a core that, you know, that, that, that saved his, uh, his political life. And that's why he will never cut it, no matter what you do. So it's the way to fight Putin is to understand the nature of Russian state. It's not I, it's classical dictatorship of 20th century. It's more like a mafia state. And Vladimir Putin is a mafia boss, capo de tutti capi. And he knows how to balance interests of different groups. But what is very important for a mafia boss is to always show that he could protect the interest of, uh, of, the, of the conflicting groups that he brought together in exchange for their loyalty. Vladimir Putin is still powerful because he can project the image of an invincible leader who could help Russian mafia, other, other groups, to steal inside the country and to place money safely to park there. Not in China, not in Venezuela, not in Iran, but in the United States, in Europe, in the free world. As long as he's seen as the protector of their interest, his position is intact. So go after those who pledge their loyalty in exchange for protection. The moment they recognize he can no longer protect them, he's doomed. They'll do the job. You know what happens with a mafia boss who is no longer capable of fulfilling his, 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 his uh, duties. It's simple. Loyalty in exchange for protection. Take away. Uh, his ability to protect Russian oligarchs and the interest of Russians, both inside but most important outside of the country. Which means you have to look for the widespread sanctions, both you know, for major companies and for, for individuals, and to make sure that Vladimir Putin fails. Look at his fellow dictators. One of the biggest Putin's showdown was to, to, to save Assad. That was a message to everybody. Obama said Assad must go, Putin said, uh-uh. Right. Where is Obama, where is Assad? When, Ameri when American Senate, following Trump's instructions, blocked uh, uh, the, 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 the Democratic bill of uh, not lifting sanctions on Deripaska, or, or like one, of the, one of the key oligarchs, that signaled back to Moscow, Putin still can call the shots. Right. So make sure that, you know, that Vladimir Putin will no longer be seen by Russian elite as their protector. They'll do the job. And don't expect Putin to, to uh, play your game. Call it engagement, use any name. America is his only hope to stay in power. That's why it will be getting worse and worse and worse. So the policy of reset brought us where we are now. 
In 2000, July 2016, Obama had on his desk full information about Russian engagement. What's happened? Nothing. The outcome, we all know that. So it will never stop as long as he's there. And there are many ways to fight him, but most important, follow the money. It worked uh, <laughs> to impeach one president, so it should work to remove one dictator. Thank you. There we go. We're done. <laughs>